Welcome everyone to the first episode of the Youth Daily Show of the GLF Biodiversity Digital Conference. My name is Jie Yin Bi. I'm the Wipart Asian Pacific Coordinator, and I'm happy to moderate this session organized by Wipart in collaboration with the Youth in Landscape Initiative. I'd like to thank the GLF for giving us the space to talk about topics that are important to us. Today, we would like to talk about the agrobiodiversity, the importance of indigenous and traditional plants, and the linkages with modern technologies. To do so, I would like to invite on stage our speakers, Lin Tang Kusama Pretivi, co-founder of Neural Farm, a youth-led company that unlocks the power of technology in the agriculture industry, and Vados Muhammad Safi Azam, country representative of My Part Bangladesh, expert in indigenous and traditional plants who will share more about the potential of traditional agrobiodiversity. Lin Tang Azam, it's a pleasure to be joined by you today. I'd love to hear a bit more about each of you. Where are you from? How did you get close to the topic of agriculture and agrobiodiversity? Hi, V, thanks for the introduction. It's such an honor and pleasure to be here. Hi, I'm Lin Tang from Indonesia. I'm serving as chef of agriculture and at Nero Farm. So basically, Nero Farm is a smart farming company who improves productivity in agriculture industry through technology. And right now, we focus on environmental friendly ways to manage pests and diseases for increased productivity and reduce loss. Nice to meet you all. Thank you, P and Lin Tang. Uh, I'm Fedus Mamad Shafil Azam from uh, Bangladesh uh, and uh, uh, hi to everyone, uh, 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 the audiences and thanks to uh, GLF for giving the opportunity to join here. Uh, I'm working on uh, traditional uh, plants and uh, indigenous vegetables since uh, 2010. So it's been a long time I'm working in this field and uh, I'm working to see the diversity of these plants and their nutritional values. And I started this work uh, when I was visited first in Tanzania for a conference on underutilized plants in 2008. And then I get to knowledge that uh, these plants are very important for food security and safety. Thank you. Good, um, Zam. So you are an expert of uh, indigenous and traditional edible plants. Could you share with us more about the importance of uh, traditional agrobiodiversity and uh, its power to tackle climate change and the nutrition crisis? Yeah, thank you for your question, B. Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, the question you raise is uh, vital, I feel, because uh, the traditional and indigenous plants have very uh, special characters because they are, you know, can grow in a very native and ecological niches. So uh, there are few characters which are very important, uh, like uh, uh, they have huge genetic diversity and as well as they can be adapted in that specific, uh, you know, like uh, environment. So in that cases, they, they, they have some different features or traits in, 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 in the sense of uh, plant science is like they are uh, tolerant or resistant to different kinds of uh, uh, abiotic and biotic stresses like uh, heat tolerance, salinity tolerant, and sometimes uh, there are different kinds of disease tolerance. So these kind of uh, native or indigenous plants uh, can be use for different breeding program because uh, uh, our conventional uh, hybrids and cultivated uh, fruits and vegetables uh, are sometimes vulnerable due to the climate change. And this kind of uh, indigenous plants can be utilized for improving those cultivated or hybrids to, to, to uh, cultivate in the stress condition. And also very important, these indigenous vegetables in some cases are very high in nutrition. So that's why this is how they can utilize for nutritional improvement also. Yeah. Wonderful. So today we can really explore the importance of traditional and modern technologies to preserve agrobiodiversity. In fact, if uh, on the one hand, Azam has shared with us, with us more about uh, traditional plants, 
Lin Tang can share with us more about the power of new technology. So Lin Tang, uh, could you please tell us more about the existing modern technology that has uh, disrupted the way we preserve biodiversity? Okay, that's a very interesting question, V. thanks. Yeah, we all knew that uh, technology has taken apart in nearly every level of our life, including how we perceive the agrobiodiversity. Before I give an example what technology are, are played right now, I'll, I'll share more about agro, agrobiodiversity itself. So simply, agrobiodiversity is diversity of agricultural system, and it's divided into four levels. We all know that the first one is genetic diversity, agricultural species like pollinators, microorganisms, micro and animals, and the third one is agroecosystem, that the interaction of factor, bio, biotic factor and abiotic factors, and also the last one is management system diversity. And we, if we will look at the first level of the um, agrobiodiversity levels, the first one is genetic diversity. We, we all know that in the US, there has been implied, implemented the applied genomic and computational strategy to utilize the germplasm for crop improvement and trade identification. It's really interesting. And the second one, the second level is agricultural species. There are a lot of IAP right now could track the bee populations uh, in the area and also could know the in condition inside the beehive. And if there's anything wrong with the beehive or temperature or humidity, they also they tend to alert the beekeeper and make things all right again. And the third one is agroecosystem. IAP has impact significantly on farming inputs. Like we could track the soil conditions and our microclimate and create an algorithm to better uh, fertilizer recommendations and also pest and disease control. And the last one is management system diversity. The use of blockchain for maintaining record of transaction of agrobiodiversity from farmers to end user. It's really interesting. So we could track uh, what we eat uh, from the seeds until in our hand. And there's a plenty of technology out there and that helps us to conserve the agri agrobiodiversity. And I projected in several years ahead that the development of technology is inevitable and we should aware of it. Uh, thank you, Lin Tang, for sharing your understanding of uh, agrobiodiversity. And indeed, modern technology has uh, disrupted the way that we preserve biodiversity and, uh, on the other hand, helped us to conserve agrobiodiversity. Uh, so, Azam, I'm very curious uh, to know a li little bit more about some indigenous and traditional plants. And uh, I know that today you have brought us two of your favorite traditional plants. Could you please introduce us to them and share with us a little bit more about each and their use? Thank you, P and Ling Teng, uh, for sharing uh, the importance and the technological importance in agrobiodiversity. Yes, P, you are right. Actually, uh, for this institute, uh, in like 10 years, I really a uh, fan of indigenous and traditional vegetables, even I came in China, uh, I was looking for all kinds of uh, traditional cuisines. And, um, and today I, I am going to share one, one what I really feel delicious and tasty in China. And this is a very traditional one. Uh, it's called uh, lotus stem or root. This is the plant actually. And this is, uh, in scientifically, it calls uh, New Limbo Nucifera. So the roots of this plant is uh, chopped and uh, eaten with the different spices depend on in a soup or stir fried. It depends on your taste. And, and it also sometimes normally tastes nearly potato. So in, in China, like uh, it's a Chinese cuisine. And also I'm really feel good when I test it with our Bangladeshi spices. That was really awesome for me. So I, I find it in both ways is very delicious. And also from this plant, it's very nutritious in different kinds of minerals and vitamins. But very important is this plant is highly rich in folate, which is very important for uh, you know, neonatal development during the pregnancy. So it's a very important vegetable that 
uh, pregnant women usually eat during pregnancy in China. And another is, this is low carbohydrate and high fi fiber content vegetable. So it is also recommended that not exactly, but if you want to intake low calories, you can intake this vegetable, yeah? And from the same plant, very interesting is it has flower and the flower has a little bit big seeds and the seeds also fresh seeds can be chewed and very delicious, a little bit sweety, but the dried one has a more interesting one. That is, th this is the dry seed we can see from here. This is the dry seed and the dry seed along with uh, the date palm. Uh, you know, like it calls uh, jujube, red jujube, dried red jujube. And maybe most uh, people know in China is called uh, tremella, a kind of fungi. So what usually in traditional uh, to like these seeds is uh, soaked in water for one hour and then make a soup uh, with this one, uh, cooked in a, as a soup with this one and this dried jujube to make a porridge with a little sugar. And that's really delicious recipe. I mean, I, I think you, you people can may try also who has this uh, lotus seeds. Uh, yeah, and it, often like when I was uh, talking with my Chinese friends also, they said, yeah, they're very, very like this, this porridge. So this is one plant actually from China. And uh, now I'm going to show another one, which is actually not Chinese. It's a uh, traditional and very indigenous vegetable from Bangladesh, but it's grown in China. That's very interesting. Chinese people don't know how to eat this, but in our country, we eat this. This is called botua in our local language, which is Chenopodium album. So this Chenopodium album usually grown uh, uh, at the early starting of the winter season and it grows in, uh, in uh, like open fields and different uh, cultivated fields in general, you know, like you can call it as a weed, but, but in our country, very indigenous, like very local people don't term it as a weed. They harvest it and we eat it as a vegetable in stir frying. And it's very nutritious in a sense of vitamin E and in mineral, it's highly rich in iron and zinc. So it has a very potential role in anemic patients. You know, who has anemia, they are prescribed to eat this kind of vegetable in a local people, I mean, a local community. So. Uh, uh, so this, this is very important in, in kind of anemic patients, as well as like it has good role in, you know, stomach parasite to kill stomach parasite. So the juice of these plants also uh, with a little bit, uh, you know, like salt, the juice is uh, drink uh, to kill, uh, you know, stomach worms, what do we call? So these are the two plants is really interesting uh, to okay. have, yeah. Thank you, Thank you, Azam, really interesting. Thank you for sharing us the functions and also the traditions of those uh, traditional plants and even the yeah. e exchanges among different countries of these species. And uh, mm. now I would like to hear a little bit more from the audience. So I would like to uh, uh, ask everyone to go on slido.com, go on use, insert the code geobiodiversity and share what is your favorite fruit and vegetable that is specific only to your area? In the meantime, I give everyone some time to react. I'd like to ask Lin Tam another question. Okay. As we have just seen, preservation of traditional agrobiodiversity is very important. So how do you think modern technologies and indigenous practices can integrate or elaborate on each other to preserve agrobiodiversity and tackle global challenges? Linta. Okay, thank you for the questions. I definitely agree that both of it can advantage each other, but we have to consider that uh, development of the technology always evolving and it purposely create our life much 
easier or much efficient. But on top of that, we should aware that creating a technology for human being or something like a life, we should really details with the uh, something like how they grow, how they live, and how they react with something because it's really unpredictable and dynamic. But don't worry, because our previous inventor said that the success story behind the people who can implement their technology is to mimic their habits and give the details on the local wisdom. And I think it's therefore that the indigenous technology is taken apart. For instance, like agroforestry, where we blend the, agro the agriculture and forestry techniques that we can enhance supply and also improve the production of the ecosystem. But I think that uh, is there any problem with we couldn't track the population and also see the balance of the nutrient cycling and each other and etc. But the with the help of technology and IoT, we could we could find and trace the population itself and could balance among the system. And the second one is crop rotation. Now, the crop rotation has been successfully um, implemented for the few decades ago and we still use it until today. But yeah, we will go. We 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 will agree that it's different crops on the same land, some land, but it helped successfully increase our uh, crop yields. But I think that nowadays farmers tend to give an extra inputs like fertilizer or pesticide. Mm -hmm. With the help of IoT, like we capture the soil conditions and also the needs of the plant, so we can uh, meet in the middle what what or how many fertilizers should we add to give an efficient and minimum effort. And I think that in conclusion that modern technology, I think it's only a tool, but uh, it's only a tool for us to make an indigenous technology more sustained and uh, efficient. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So Azam, what's your opinion on this? Yeah, thank you, Ling Chang. That's a pretty nice uh, explanation why where modern technology and the indigenous uh, technology are merging. And um, yeah, I, I also have the same um, positive opinion what the LinkedIn said, but I would have some personal experience from my country. Like uh, there is a kind of um, a traditional cultivation system like uh, nearly 100 years ago. And this traditional system is uh, uh, cultivating um, crops and plants in a floating garden. You know, and uh, this floating garden was like, uh, you know, uh, in a few villages in our country in a specific district, and they were collecting and gathering the water hyacinths, which naturally grow during the, uh, you know, like rainy season. And they collect those uh, water hyacinths and make a bed for those. And then they, on this bed, they make small, uh, small uh, balls with water hyacinth and put uh, some uh, soils inside and uh, and put the seeds and this ball put in the water uh, hyacinth beds and then they grow up and they cultivate the vegetable for so many I mean I mean like so many decades and in last 10 years the government uh, actually promoting this floating garden technology all over the country because uh, like for the last uh, last one decade the problem arise in Bangladesh due to global climate change uh, the sea level rise. So there is a little sli slight saline soil is locked in so many places in the country. You know, the sea level rise, so water is logging. So the government implementing this kind of floating bed technology for those water locked areas for, you know, producing agricultural vegetable and other products so that, you know, like thousands of Acres land are now under the cultivation, and and also a lot of research is going on how new technologies can be improved. This old, you know, water bed, uh, water hyacinth bed, Byra technology, which is called Byra. So these two are merging, and you can see in the internet this floating water bed technology is tremendously exploring all over the country. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So now let's get back to the Slido to see everyone's answer. And in the meantime, I'd like to invite everyone to ask their questions to Linta and Azam in the Wuhan chat. Okay, so. Wow. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. know this Kio. Uh, so Linta and Azam, do you know Back any of fruit. them? 
Yeah, yeah jackfruit yeah. is is very common in my country. Uh, yeah, mulberry and kale. Yeah, that's delicious. Yeah. I know um, tangerines and jackfruit. Yeah, and the cassava. Cassava leaves are very very nutritious. That I know. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of, lot of wow. uh, you know, plant names are coming. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So agribiodiversity is very important for the local food sovereignty and uh, food security of community. So I have the question, uh, do you have any story to share on um, how flourishing agribiodiversity has been supporting community during the COVID crisis? Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, in Indonesia, we know that not in only nation, all over the world, COVID-19 has become our new normal for the past seven months. And it really hits us, especially in Indonesia. There are some restrictions and limitations, so they cannot transport the crops, the, the staple crops across the city. And I think the people or the farmer who implement the agrobiodiversity like intercropping agroforest is really benefiting them for the food security of the local. And the second phenomenon that, that I capture in Indonesia that the booming, uh, the, the rising of the herbal and indigenous medicine in Indonesia called jamu. So it consists of traditional plant like ginger or, or like the herb spices. And they really, really in high, high uh, demand because it could boost our immune and to prevent the spread of COVID. And, in some of the area that has evidence a uh, source of the traditional plant, they tend to create a new business, new SME, and it becomes a source of new income in this COVID area. It's in the COVID era. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, so Azem? Yeah, thank you, Lingtang. I was not aware like what Indonesia is doing. Yeah, um, uh, I, I, I have some experience from China, what, you know, like this is because it was the epicenter at the beginning. So what I, I have uh, written some uh, during the, when the pandemic started, uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, rubber gardens in China. It's a very, you know, like uh, economic uh, sector in China. And due to pandemic, everything was shut down and the farmers were having, you know, uh, a disease which is called powdery mildew, powdery mildew and anthracnose. So the disease infected a lot of gardens. And then the expert think like, okay, now we cannot manage because the travel is restricted and people cannot meet. So how we could deal? Then they integrated and advised pharma to implement some plants, medicinal plants, which is uh, you know, alpine oxyphyla. It's a kind of very uh, uh, high value medicinal plant in China. And they planted this medicinal plant to continue, you know, like uh, generating their income uh, to, to, to mitigate the loss. This is how uh, they did in China. And also in, in Bangladesh, I have something, uh, something yes. to say, like uh, some communities also, you know, like um, you know, preserve a lot of, you know, um, vegetable as a processed food, you know. And those processed food help them to continue several days until they can reach to the to the market to have you know buy and other foods. So this is how a lot of different ways agro diversity can okay. integrate. Thank you, yeah. Adam. Yeah, yeah. So now we have the questions from the audience. So Lin Chang, there's a question for you. That uh, how is the access of indigenous technologies arranged in your community? Yeah, that's very interesting questions. So in Indonesia, especially everyone has access to the indigenous technology and it's already common in our technology because Indonesia is an agriculture country and everybody needs the food and we all since our, our little it's already have been learned by us. And how is the technology on? So everybody could access the technology and but uh, right now, it's very common that startup in youth like me or uh, everyone who have interest in agriculture could uh, create the technology and implement with their local farmers or local people. Okay, thank you. So there's a question for Azam. Uh, how can we encourage and support the youth in practicing agribiodiversity? Azam. Okay, thank you, D. Uh, yes, that's right. Uh, it's a very potential um, issue you raise. You know, um, 
during the uh, pandemic, we learn how to tackle the future generation and future scenario of us. So it's a post pandemic scenario and we have to uh, integrate youth in, in uh, so many ways to agrobiodiversity, like because there is a lot of you know, channels uh, in, in youth uh, levels, like uh, different youth clubs and young, young groups, so that we have to take an uh, initiative and alert them how this agrobiodiversity help them in future to generate and, and cope with this uh, post-pandemic scenario and also generate their, you know, like income and businesses for the, you know, like any future outbreaks or pandemics. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you so much for both of you uh, to be here with us today. We are aware that uh, climate change has endangered the life of not only human beings, but also the wild creatures and uh, the living ecosystem. In order to increase the awareness of the agrobiodiversity protection among young generations, YPAD, Young Professional for Agriculture Research, is initiating a youth task force on agrobiodiversity conservation, where we want to build a platform for youth to identify, protect, share, and extend the good practices on agrobiodiversity conservation. And we are also trying to raise the voice of youth to be heard and mainstreaming in the global agriculture governance. If you have expertise, uh, and if you are interested in ecosystem restoration, climate change, and preserving biodiversity, we sincerely welcome you, all of you, to join the Biodiversity Youth Task Force. You may follow YPAT on Facebook, Twitter, WeChat, or send email at asia at ypart.net. The Youth Daily Show will be back today at 12.30 Central European Time in an episode on transformative change organized in a collaboration between the Youth in Landscape Initiative and the Global Youth Diversity Network. Thank you.